He was finally identified after nearly 40 years, but the mystery of how he got there still remains. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of David Stack. Viewer discretion is advised. It was June 10th, 1976, in Tuella County, Utah. At a local landfill there, a human body was discovered. So police were contacted and the body was taken to the coroner's office where they determined that this individual died of a homicide. There were gunshot wounds to this individual's head. However, that information about the gunshot wounds were not initially released to the public. First and foremost, they had no idea who this person was. They determined that the individual was somewhere between the ages of 17 and maybe 22, 23 years old. He had dark brown wavy hair, and his hair was about at his shoulders. He had brown eyes. He had kind of some stubble on his, on his face. He was about 5 foot 9, weighed approximately 170 pounds. The individual was dressed, but he had no shoes or socks on, and those shoes were never found. He did have a fresh scar on his forehead. He had a vaccination scar on one of his shoulders. And on his right foot, he had a hammer toe deficiency. Now, years down the road, they would come up with a uh, digitalized composite image of this young man, which is the image you are seeing here. This was 1976. This was before uh, cities and states had the instant communication that we have today. This is also before social media. You couldn't just put a person's face on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok and boom, you have thousands of people chiming in about who that person might be. And so because this individual had no identification on them, all they really had to work with was his image. So initially, when they had his autopsy photo out there, before they had released a digital image of him, they did get some potential tips about people who saw this young man prior. So around 3 p.m. he was seen literally just the day before he was found. And he was seen kind of walking around the town or the city of Wendover, Utah. But nobody knew who this young man was. Even though they saw him, they didn't really see him with anyone. He seemed to be by himself, but again, nobody knew who he was. So that it really was a kind of a dead end. This was before cameras were everywhere, so we couldn't like look at security footage. So I, they were really at a standstill again. A computerized uh, digital recreation of this young man's face wasn't really made until 2010 when the NCMEC got involved, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. But even still in 2010 with that image out there, it didn't generate a, a lot of tips right away. However, this, that is now a time when the internet is very prevalent, and, and it wasn't until about 2015 or so when they were able to take, I guess, some tissue they had collected from this John Doe back in the initial autopsy, and they were able to create a, a partial DNA profile from it. And using genetic genealogy, they were able to basically trim it down to a particular family. And now the communication is much different today, or at least in 2015, they were able to find the family. The family was able to see this computerized image and go, oh my God, that looks like our missing person. And so what they did is they had that individual's dental records and the authorities in Utah got it and they compared it to the John Doe's initial dental uh, images and they confirmed that this might be this, in this individual who was missing. But they needed to know for absolute sure that the tissue sample they had from the John Doe wasn't exactly great. And so what they did was they got uh, DNA samples directly from this individual's family. They then exhumed the body of the John Doe in Utah and they compared the John Doe's DNA to the family member's DNA and it was a match. The individual whose body was sitting in a grave for nearly 40 years was a young man named David Stack. He was 18 years old at the time of his murder. 
and this was a definite murder. He had two gunshot wounds to the back of his head. David Stack was born on July 5th, 1967, and for what it looks like, he was born in New Milford, Connecticut. However, at the time this case happened, he had moved to Colorado. I don't know if it was by himself or if it was like the whole family moved out there, but he had graduated high school and then moved to Colorado. And according to family, uh, he was someone who wanted to basically go on an adventure. After high school was over, he wanted to do something different. And so he was going to hitchhike and find his way to California because he had two siblings who lived in Northern California that he wanted to go visit. David was part of a pretty humongous family. There was like, uh, I think, nine kids in this family overall. Uh, he graduated from New Fil Milford High School. David was a very popular young man. He had a lot of friends, uh, especially throughout high school. And he was someone they said that could make friends literally wherever he went. He was just that type of person where if he goes somewhere, he's like immediately socializing with people. He just becomes friends with people. I can't personally relate. <laughs> I'm, I'm very anti-people. But David was a happy-go-lucky, free-spirited, kind of borderline, maybe hippie type uh, person. He was just a kind of chill, you know, uh, just go with the flow type of person. So according to David's family, he left the home around June 1st, 1976 in Colorado. And again, he was supposed to get to Northern California they weren't really sure when because he was hitchhiking. And back in the 70s, hitchhiking was very common. And that's also when a lot of hitchhiking in 70s and 80s, when a lot of hitchhiking murders happened. But it was the norm back then. But the thing is, is he never made it to Northern California and his siblings kind of waited a couple extra days because maybe he got distracted or something. And, but after a few days, he still hadn't gotten there. So the family, her, her siblings, contacts his family from uh, Colorado and Connecticut and they haven't heard from David. They haven't seen him since he left the house on June 1st to go to California. So he is reported missing, you know, very quickly. But like I said earlier, communication back then was not anywhere close to what we have now. There wasn't this immediate, you pull, put a picture in, a, in, a, in their database and a, a police in Connecticut or Colorado or wherever will see it. You kind of had to rely on old school gumshoeing and, you know, uh, mailing photos and driving out to these states to see, you know, is this your person? So because of that, because there wasn't that type of connection that we have now, they didn't know that their John Doe in Utah was this missing kid from Colorado. So in the interview family, they do find out that David had been calling his siblings throughout this little journey of his. Uh, and sometime around June 7th, June 8th or so, they did get a phone call from David that he was still on his way. But then after that, communication stopped. And that's that was another red flag of like, well, that's weird. He promised to basically call us every day. But again, they were just like, you know, he got distracted. He was just, they didn't think a whole lot of that until a few days after, you know, he stopped calling. And unfortunately, it would take 40 years for his family to find out what the hell happened to him. That David was shot twice and he was just thrown away like garbage in a landfill. I mean, think about it. Your family member goes missing and this whole time you're thinking, you're thinking all sorts of things. Was he killed? Did he decide to just say, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to go and live my own life somewhere else and never talk to anyone in my life ever again. Did he meet someone and like maybe fell in love or, you know, it was so many possibilities, but it just the whole time he was lying in an unmarked grave for 40 years while his family still clung on to hope that maybe he's out there somewhere and that his final moments were in probably utter terror. And then he was just chucked into a landfill. That was the end of David Stack's life. He ended up in a landfill, just buried amongst trash. And unfortunately, nobody knows who did it. Sure, one part of this mystery, a huge part of this mystery of who was this guy, that was solved. It took a long time, but now the mystery remains of who put two bullets into David and then threw him away, and why. David wasn't like strapped with cash. I mean, he had the bare minimum to get himself to California. 
he didn't wasn't really work he wasn't working so it's like what was the motive here it didn't appear i can't tell if like there was any evidence of maybe a sexual assault occurred i don't know i mean his body was found literally a day after he was last seen alive so his body wasn't even really decomposing at that point so they would have been able to tell whether or not maybe there was a sexual aspect to this case but i i don't know if that's i don't know so was it robbery or was maybe the intent to rob him? Then they realize, oh, he has nothing, but now I need to kill him because, well, he can t tell people who I am. Did he just meet up with the wrong crowd? Was he hitchhiking and got into just the worst possible person's car? And that person was just a psychopath who said, you know what? I'm going to have my own fun today by killing someone. The possibilities, the potential motives seem to be endless because they don't know. They just don't know. And because of the fact that nobody knew who he was back in 1976, they had people who saw him walking around town. That's all they had. Like, they didn't have any information about if he was seen with a person. They know, No one saw him getting into a, a person's car. So they don't know who he was back then. They don't know what he was doing. They don't, they don't know anything. And so the investigation was, there wasn't anything they could do. They didn't even know where to go. They didn't know where to start with. They didn't know who to talk to. They had nothing to go on. And now that there's this 40-year difference, what are the odds of them now finding evidence all of a sudden? It's going to be slim to nil. The only chance, the only real possibility they have is eyewitness testimonies. Maybe now that his identity is known, you can put his actual picture out there. Maybe, just maybe, someone will remember. I mean, yeah, it's 40 years ago. The people... The person who might have done this or persons would probably be maybe, I don't know, in their 60s-ish around that, just depending on how old they were at the time. How often are you going to be able to remember something you saw 40 years ago? We're talking about witnesses you may have seen, David. Like, when you didn't realize you were supposed to be looking for something. Like, you weren't supposed to be paying extra attention to a person. So whose memories are really going to be, you know, jogged? You never know. I mean, there might be someone out there who definitely remembers seeing him, may maybe with someone, and maybe that person can finally come forward. Maybe his killer or killers talked. Maybe they said something. Maybe they told you, uh, and you've been afraid to come forward because maybe they'll retaliate against you. Well, now it's 40 years later. Maybe you're no longer associated with this person, this murderer, this monster, and now you can come forward to police to say, hey, I do know something about who did that to this young man. And if you're still scared or you're nervous, you can always come forward and tell your story anonymously. You don't have to say who you are. You just have to say what you know. That's it. So that is a possibility. Or maybe they can take whatever evidence they have from the crime scene and maybe nowadays they can swab it and see if there's any like DNA on it. Maybe any uh, skin cell DNA, anything, blood, anything. You know, maybe that came from the killer that they can identify that way. But it doesn't sound like they really, I don't know if they've done that or not, to be honest with you. I don't know if they've taken the evidence and have rechecked it. I don't know. The only thing I know is that David Stack was a carefree, happy-go-lucky dude who wanted to take a little adventure to go visit some siblings in California. He left his home in Colorado and was never seen alive by his family or friends ever again. David's life ended abruptly, probably in complete horror to him, and then his life ended in a landfill. That is where David Stack's life took him, with two bullet holes and thrown away like garbage. So if you know something, anything, about the murder of David Stack, I know it's been a long time, but you, if you know, you know. And so you can please go forward to police. So if you have information about the murder of David Stack in 1976, please call 435-843-3351. Please help David Stack and his family get the justice he very rightfully deserves. But that is it for this case, True Crime, Aruni, Duni, Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. Um, as usual, please subscribe if you are into true crime. I tell true crime stories here on YouTube. I also tell short, shorter form true crime stories over on TikTok. You can follow me over there. 
The link to that is in the link tree, which is in the description of this video below. So feel free to check those out if you want. If there is a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email. My email is also listed in the description. All I really need to know is the name of the individual, the case, um, where it happened, preferably if you know, and if you know when it happened, it's easier to find it with those three things, especially if it's like a common name. But yeah, just send me a quick email and I will add it to my list. The list is long, it's like 64-ish hundred names long. So I pick my cases at random. I can't promise you when I'll cover you the case you recommended, but I will get to it eventually, I promise. But at any rate, that is it for this video, True Crime Aroonies. So we will see you for the next one. And until then, ta-ta for now. Mm-hmm.